The content of this podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended as, nor should it be considered a substitute for professional medical advice. Sweaty and pissed, sweaty and pissed, menopause makes me sweaty and pissed. Hello everyone, this is Karen Nickel, family nurse practitioner in for Sweaty and Pissed, Menopause and More, and I am back with some listener questions. And again, I want to thank everyone for their comments and questions on Facebook. It's um, great to hear from you and great to hear what questions you have and how we can help you. Um, there are a couple of things I'm going to discuss today. One is about recurrent UTIs. And the other problem is uh, herpes outbreaks. So I thought they were related, so I'd put those together in a, in a podcast for you today. First of all, uh, Charlene says, Hi, ladies. I would like to see a future podcast discuss UTIs. Are they preventable? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Thank you so much. Love your podcasts. So we'll talk about that today, Charlene. And then Evelyn says, hello, ladies, can you talk about genital herpes? Are there supplements to take to calm that down? All my providers just tell me, sorry, there is nothing to take more than Valtrex, which is a prescription antiviral. I have had an outbreak down there sometimes two to three times a month, but always with menses. I am up to one gram of Valtrex one time daily to keep it at bay. And when an outbreak happens, I have to do two grams two times daily until the burning calms down. Any advice would be wonderful. I can't be the only one dealing with this. And trust me, you're not. Um, It is very embarrassing and you feel gross having this and no one will help you. But the statistics say it's eight out of 10 people who have it. Thanks for a great podcast. I started Vitex and my hot flashes at night have stopped. My primary said, just deal with it. No, sir, I won't. Uh, And I don't know if you recall, but Vitex is a chased berry, which is a supplement that can help with increased progesterone secretion. So it can often help uh, perimenopausal and premenopausal symptoms. I'm going to speak about urinary tract prevention first. Urinary tract infections can be miserable and very frustrating if it becomes a recurrent problem. While a short course of antibiotics will clear up an infection, it is best for your health to avoid frequent use of antibiotics. Prevention measures will limit the need for antibiotic treatment, and here are some simple prevention measures you can take. First of all, drink plenty of water and relieve yourself often. The simplest way to prevent a UTI is to flush bacteria out of the bladder and urinary tract before it can take hold. If you're well hydrated, it will be tough to go too long without urinating. Please try to empty your bladder every two to three hours. Wipe from front to back. This is something most of us have been taught or told to do, but bacteria can tend to hang around the rectal area. So if you wipe from front to back, especially after a bowel movement, the bacteria are less likely to make it to the urethra. Wash up before sex and urinate after it. Use soap and water before sex. Cleaning off those tissues before intercourse decreases the bacteria on the skin and keeps the bacteria away from the urethra. And urinating afterward pushes any bacteria that enter the urinary tract back out. Please, please, please don't use irritating feminine products. Skip skip the douches, skip the deodorant sprays, scented powders, scented panty liners or pads, and other potentially irritating feminine products. You may need to rethink your birth control. A diaphragm, spermicide, or spermicide lubricated condom can make you more likely to get a UTI because they all can contribute to bacterial growth. If you often get UTIs and use one of those birth control methods, try switching to a water-based lubricant for vaginal dryness and try Uh, or consider trying another birth control method to see if that would help. 
Other lifestyle changes can include wearing cotton underwear, taking showers instead of baths, and avoiding tight clothes that can trap bacteria near the urethra. Although these methods are not supported by scientific data, you should continue these techniques if they work for you. Another important measure is to focus on vaginal health. Taking measures to maintain vaginal health can really aid in the prevention of UTIs. For premenopausal women, this can include changing tampons or pads frequently, use a vaginal pH balancer, especially after the period, Over-the-counter refresh can be used by inserting the gel vaginally once or twice a week, and that will help keep the pH balance and keep bad bacteria out of the vaginal area. For menopausal women, methods include adding vaginal estrogen, if that is appropriate for you. This is usually dosed twice a week. If, especially if vaginal estrogen is not a a good choice for you, say, if you have a personal history of breast cancer. You can consider vaginal rejuvenation treatments like Mona Lisa Touch or Votiva. And even if you do use vaginal estrogen, these are good options for you to use these rejuvenation treatments. They are vaginal laser treatments, uh, usually a series of three sessions performed at a medical office Often that's at a urology or a gynecology office. And it restores the tissue to the firm, moist tissue that it once was and really helps um, prevent any kind of vaginal bacterial problems or UTIs. Other methods appropriate for pre- or postmenopausal women include taking a cranberry supplement. I have found that the supplement Theracran T-H-E-R-A-C-R-A-N, Theracran, daily, has really helped my patients. Um, taking a probiotic that addresses vaginal health will, that contain lactobacillus can also help. A couple of those options include Garden of Life Raw Probiotics Vaginal Care and Pro-B by Refresh. Also, using a prescription antibiotic, just one cap after intercourse can really help with UTI prevention and limits your need for an antibiotic treatment by just taking one cap after intercourse. For recurrent UTIs, sometimes a daily probiotic for up to six months is is prescribed to correct the problem. Sometimes you just have to do that to get the bacteria level down in the bladder so that you don't keep having infections. You know, if you have small children, um, it is really helpful to teach them good bladder hygiene from the get-go so that uh, they don't end up dealing with some of the things that you may be dealing with. So some of those tips are to take them to the bathroom and have them do a bathroom break every two to three hours. Um, encourage complete emptying of the bladder, and sometimes that just means taking some time while peeing. Also, teach girls to wipe from front to back after urinating. Avoid wearing tight underwear or tight clothing, and avoid bubble baths. And of course, as it's true for you, it should be true for them, make sure that they stay hydrated. So I hope that helps with some of the UTI prevention strategies. And I am going to take a little break right now, and I'll be back with some discussion about suppressing herpes simplex virus. Welcome back. And before I get started on speaking about herpes simplex virus, I do want to remind you to visit our merchandise store and you can access that link via our Facebook page or on our website, sweatyandpiss.com. And the and is spelled out, sweatyandpiss.com. And there's lots of fun merchandise to purchase. Um, We've had a lot of good feedback on the products, and uh, we have shirts and fanny packs and masks and leggings. uh, So they're, oh, and socks. 
can't, can't forget the socks. People really love the socks. So um, please check that out and uh, get your merchandise for Sweaty and Pissed. Um, so on the herpes simplex, um, before I talk about suppression methods, I do want to just review a little bit about herpes simplex. First of all, what is herpes and how is it caused? The herpes simplex virus, also known as HSV, which is how I'll refer to it from now on, is an infection that causes herpes. And herpes can appear in different parts of the body, most commonly on the genitals or mouth. The herpes simplex virus is a contagious virus that can be transmitted from person to person through direct contact. Children actually will often contract HSV-1 or or oral herpes from early contact with an infected adult. Then they carry the virus with them for the rest of their lives. There are two types of the herpes simplex virus. HSV-1 primarily causes oral herpes and is generally responsible for cold sores and fever blisters around the mouth, on the face, and sometimes in the nose. We can actually even get herpes simplex in the eyes that cause a lot of itching and feeling like you have gravel in your eyes. Um, HSV-1 can be contracted from general interactions such as eating from the same utensils, sharing lip balm, kissing. The virus spreads more quickly when an infected person is experiencing an outbreak. An estimated 67% of people ages 49 or younger have blood tests that show they've been exposed to HSV-1, though they may never experience an outbreak. It's also possible to get genital herpes from HSV-1 if someone who performed oral sex had cold sores at the time. HSV-2 primarily causes genital herpes and is generally responsible for genital herpes outbreaks. HSV-2 is contracted through forms of sexual contact with a person who has HSV-2. An estimated 20% of sexually active adults in the United States are infected with HSV-2, according to the American Academy of Dermatology. HSV-2 infections are spread through contact with a herpes sore. In contrast, most people who get HSV-1 from an infected person uh, do so from someone who is asymptomatic or does not have sores. Risk factors for contracting HSV-2 include having sex without protection using condoms or other barrier methods, having multiple sex partners, having sex at a younger age, being female, lucky us, uh, having other, another sexually transmitted infection, and having a weakened immune system. Symptoms can include blistering sores in the mouth or on the genitals, and usually these are quite painful. Pain during urination, itching, fever, swollen lymph nodes, headaches, tiredness, lack of appetite, Really, a lot of times before an outbreak, people will have flu-like symptoms. Triggers uh, for an outbreak, once you have herpes, include general illness, uh, fatigue, physical or emotional stress, immunosuppression due to AIDS or such medications as chemotherapy or steroids, trauma to the affected area, including sexual activity, and menstruation. How is herpes diagnosed? Well, during an exam by your provider, a herpes culture can be obtained by collecting fluids using a swab on the genital tissue that is affected. This test looks for the presence of the actual virus. A blood test can also be ordered to check for antibodies to HSV-1 and HSV-2. This is not checking for active disease, but will determine if you've been exposed to the virus. There are also self-tests available to check for the presence of herpes. You can do um, in your home uh, yourself. And one company that provides that uh, testing is called Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked. Um, 
and you just order the kit online and do the test yourself. And I'll have a link. I do have a link in the blog for you to a uh, hyperlink to click on and get to that website if you're interested in that. So how is herpes treated? Unfortunately, there is no cure for the virus currently, but outbreaks can be treated or prevented using prescription antiviral medications like acyclovir, famcyclovir, or valcyclovir. They can be taken whenever an outbreak occurs or taken daily to prevent the outbreak. Taking an antiviral daily can also reduce the chance of transmission to someone else. Our listener mentioned that she had remained celibate for eight years because she didn't want to transmit the virus to anyone else. But I do want to remind her that um, taking an antiviral every day significantly reduces viral shedding and so significantly reduces the chance of transmitting it to your partner And again, a barrier method like a condom will also help tremendously in preventing transmission to a partner. Other ways to help reduce outbreaks include um, taking the -the over-the-counter supplement L-lysine. You can take one gram three times daily to treat an outbreak or one gram daily to prevent outbreaks. You can also include foods in your diet that are high in L-lysine. Some examples of those foods are beef, chicken, turkey, pork, codfish, sardines, eggs, yogurt, Parmesan cheese, spirulina, which mostly you find in supplements, uh, and soybeans. And in terms of a, a lysine supplement, I have talked about Patch MD on previous podcasts, and um, they have an antiviral patch and it contains a lysine. So that could be an, os- um, an option too, that you wear a daily patch, the antiviral patch from somewhere like patchmd.com. And uh, if you don't want to take an extra supplement by mouth. Uh, another way to prevent outbreaks is to support your immune system. And you can support your immune system by reducing stress. And these are all things that we've talked about many, many times on the podcast before, but reducing stress, getting enough sleep, eating a healthy diet, exercising, and taking supplements like vitamin C, 500 to 1,000 milligrams daily, and zinc, 20 to 40 milligrams daily. You can also support your immune system by taking an adrenal support supplement. And if you visit our website, sweatyandpiss.com, and go to the blog portion, which is at the bottom of the page, the web page, um, you will find a blog from me that has a list of supplements. And I have an adrenal support section on there, and you can check out those uh, supplements on that blog. To our listener who asked what else she can do to prevent HSV outbreaks, if you are taking a daily prescription antiviral for prevention, which you said you were, and if you were adding L-lysine and doing all the things you can to support your immune system and are still having outbreaks, I recommend that you have a blood test to check your immunoglobulin levels and make sure they are in the normal range. If they are low, you need to see an immunologist who can determine if you need immunoglobulin therapy. So your immune system may just be inadequate to continue to suppress the virus. And I'm a little concerned that because you're still having two to three outbreaks a month while on daily antiviral therapy, that um, your immune system needs to be checked. And it's an easy thing to do to have a blood test to check immunoglobulins, see if they're sufficient, and if they are not, then to seek help to boost your immunoglobulin levels. And there are treatments to do that. So I so appreciate your um, listener questions and comments, uh, and I hope this information has helped you. I am 
going to post the blog with all this information on it and all the links to all the supplements and to the treatment regimens that I discussed. Uh, There'll be hyperlinks for all those things. So it'll be easy to connect and find that information. Again, I want you to visit the website or our Facebook page to link to our merchandise store and uh, find something that you find fun and colorful that you can wear and think of us when you wear it. Uh, We're so glad you're out there listening and uh, so glad that you feel that we have provided you some fun and information. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. I hope you'll stay well. I hope you'll be safe. And I really want you to wear a mask. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate your being there. We will see you next week. Sweet.